and the deputy of the church was waiting for him outside and he took him in big huge church we entered there was nothing inside oh he said this is a modern church he said yes this is a modern church come i'll show you inside the chair there was buttons so you press one button ching, and the chairs came up they came down <laughs> And he pressed another button, and the pulpit came up. <laughs> and he pressed another button, the choir stall came up. Press another button, the lights came down. And there's very oh, you press so many buttons, but this one button you didn't press. Oh, that's a special button. When the preacher preaches too long, I press this button. <laughs> <laughs> so. Reverend Moderator, it's a joy to be with you. Thank you for, for inviting me. And Nan, I've got to know you so well. I've been preparing in much prayer as I came, come here, which much, much fear and trembling. And what I'm about to share with you this evening is something that many of you are familiar with. So please forgive me for repeating them, for the, it is prudent for us to be reminded from the word of God. I bring greetings from the Reverend Lamin, the moderator of the Brethren Church of India, moderator, and the principal and staff of the John Roberts Theological College. <coughs> we have only 289 students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of them are doing the BD and a few of them doing the MTH and God willing in, in four months time you'll be able to teach the doctor of theology I also bring to you very warm greetings from the United Bible Societies we are very busy these days trying to get our secretary from Sudan to go to go to go to Egypt get away from all the problems there and I bring very warm greetings from Franklin Graham he knows that I'm here and he sends his love to all of you here in Wales on the 22nd of June every year the government back home gives us all a holiday do you know why because that is the day when Thomas Jones in 1841 landed in Northeast India. And we share this day with glory to God that God has brought the gospel to the missionary from Wales. However, unfortunately, this gospel that you brought is becoming diluted, not only in India, but in other parts of the world. There is a tendency today, moderator, even among Christian leaders, to view that Jesus is only one savior. He is only one among the many, many saviors in the world. The fact, however, is that Christianity is unique, is absolute, it's definitive, it's ultimate, and it is final. During the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches in New Delhi, Dr. Vishnu, who one of the greatest secretaries of the World Council of Churches, this is what he said. It is high time that Christians should rediscover that Jesus Christ did not come to make a contribution to the religious storehouse of mankind but in him God reconciled the world unto himself Max Muller many of you you know him he's the German scholar was a champion of comparative study of religions made this interesting statement he said this is what he said you do not know the worth of your Christian faith until you have compared it to others and this is why I agree with John Stott when he said Christians must claim uniqueness and finality only for Christ. 
not for Christianity in any of its institutional or cultural reforms. Bishop Stephen Neal was a bishop for many years in India. This is what he said. Jesus Christ is not in the least like anyone else that has ever, who has ever lived. And this amazing fact that God has chosen us as the church to represent him. May I remind you this evening who we are. In every recognized country in the world, there is a British High Commission in India because we're a Commonwealth nation or a British embassy in another nations. A British embassy is really a little bit of United Kingdom a long way from home. It is where the UK laws, rules are adhered to. All embassies have sovereign territories. They do not belong to the country they are in. They belong to the country they are from. To get into trouble, I'm sorry, I'm reading my manuscript. I'm not <laughs> preaching, I'm lecturing. So I'm reading my manuscript, all right? <laughs> Forget I'm an evangelist. If you get into trouble in any country, you want to cross that embassy gate. Because the moment you cross that embassy gate, the rules and the laws of the country, which the embassy is, 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 takes over. God has an embassy in history, and that is called the church. The church is God's embassy to bring the value of the homeland, heaven, into the foreign land, earth. God has set up an embassy in this world through the church. The church is not to represent the country it is in, but the country where it's from. So the point of the church is to represent heaven in history. Remember the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is constantly directing us, the church, how he wants us to represent himself in the foreign land. He's using the church to see that his will be done. He wants us to represent God in this foreign land with all its various cultures. However, as I travel all over, one of the problems today is that the church, unfortunately, has adapted the worldview, the values of the country it is, rather than the value of the homeland. And that has added chaos and confusion as to who we are, and what we are today. God always wants us, wants to work through the church. So when the church is not the church, when the church is merely a religious organization in the world, with perhaps lots of money, I do not know, <laughs> when it's merely adopting the values of the world while sprinkling a little bit of the Bible and a little bit of Jesus on top to make it seem okay. It does not represent the church. Then we should not be surprised that if the image of the church becomes tainted because God does not have an embassy that he could depend on. One godly pastor said this, the church today could no longer say like Paul and John in Acts chapter three, silver and gold have we none. Unfortunately, it also cannot say like Paul and John 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That spiritual impact of the church is lost today. So I want to remind us the truths that many of you already know. But for the sake of this paper that I presented, none have prepared for it. I believe it is prudent for me to remind you the passage in Matthew chapter 16, where we have the first mention of the word church in the Bible. The disciples were in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asked the question, whom do men say that the Son of Man am? In other words, what is the gossip around town about me? Jesus is asking. The disciples replied, yes, they're gossiping about you, Jesus. Some say, thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias, others, Jeremiah and one of the prophets. All these are great men and good men. And then Jesus asked a second question. Whom do you say that I am? And the word here, ye, or hymas, in the Greek word is a plural. He's asking the whole group. And Peter, good old Peter, wish we could talk about Peter tonight. He's like, <laughs> anyway, Peter. Peter is the leader of the disciples. Said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. He identifies Jesus as the Messiah. The Hebrew word Messiah is anointed in Judaism. Anointed, expected king of Davidic rule who would deliver Israel from foreign bondage and restore the glories of its golden age. So the Messiah was the anticipated king and ruler who would bring heaven into history and who would rule the earth as a son of God, a deity incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus compliments Peter. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, all flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. It is the divinely inspired declaration of my Father, Peter, not you. And with this acceptance, Jesus declared the church, his embassy, or his to call it, what's the other word for embassy? Uh, High Commission in the world. And he continues to declare, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He says to Peter, thou art Peter, Petros, to remind Peter who he was. He called him Petros, which means a stone. Peter is now the official spokesperson of the church. He would be the one who will open the doors of the church on the day of Pentecost, remember? It was Peter. He was the Petros. Then we read, Jesus says, upon this rock, Petra, the Greek word Petra, I will build my church. Petra is the feminine word of Petros. We all know that, need to tell you. The church is not built on Petros, it is built on Petra. If you read a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other Christian, early Christian literature, the normal meaning of Petra is a bedrock of massive rock formation, <laughs> which is distinct from Petros, which is a, is a detached stone or boulder. The word Peter in Greek is Petros, which means a piece of rock, a stone, a single rock, movable, shifting. But Petra means a collection of rocks that have been joined together to form something bigger that is not only one rock of its own. It's a large mass of rocks or a collection of believers in the name of Jesus Christ to come together to represent the kingdom of heaven. That is why Peter in his letter in 1 Peter 2, 5, he, this is what he said, ye also as living stones are built up 
a spiritual house. So, my dear friends, the church is not just a social gathering, as some places have become. Neither is it a merely religious gathering. The church is God's embassy. It's a gathering of divinely ordained representatives who act on behalf of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Ecclesia, interesting word in the New Testament. If you Google Ecclesia, this is what it says. A political assembly of citizens of ancient Greek states. So when Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia, my church, this is what he meant. A legislative body of a particular area. So Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia, the church. I suppose he did not mean that he's going to be gathering just a few group of people on Sunday morning for an hour or two to sing and to worship and to read the word of God that is important, but he meant much more than that. It means something more. I am going to build my legislative body, my spiritual parliament into the lives of men and women. So the job of the church is to draw heaven into history, eternity into time. The job of the church is to bring God's viewpoint into the culture I repeat that. The job of the church is to bring heaven's viewpoint into the culture. The issue is not letting the culture get into the church. Remember the words of Paul in Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world. So our job is to bring the legislation from heaven based on the word of God down to this earth. And we are not charged or commissioned as a church with a political agenda, but we are charged with a biblical agenda. And this agenda is Jesus Christ and him crucified who was resurrected on the third day. When Jesus gave his disciples a great commission in Matthew chapter 28, then in the gospel, this is what he said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is saying that he is now the Lord of heaven and eternity. And he's the Lord of the earth and history. All authority, all exousia. King James 1621 translated this as power. But the new King James in 1982 translated this as authority. There are a number of words for power and authority in the Bible. The Greek word dunamis, which means power, we get dynamite. And the other word is exousia. Here, Jesus is using the word exousia, which means that he has been authorized to rule or to check if anyone breaks the rule in this world. Perhaps the best example of the difference between power and authority is a Heldreit or a so football game. In what, what do you say for a football game, soccer game? Bill right, Bill right, Bill right. I'm learning Welsh. <laughs> so in, in, in a soccer game, in a, in a football match, the players are very young. Gareth Bale, he got an MBE. Mark Hughes, he got an OBE. Ryan Giggs, he got an OBE in Manchester United. Very strong. And the referees are usually older. Like Keith Cooper, you all know him. Clive Thomas from the Rhondda Valley. They're older. The players have dunamis. The referees has exousia. The players, they can kick the ball, dribble it up and down, and all the referees are <laughs> stop. 
because the referee has been authorized by FIFA to do that. They have the legitimate power. So, my beloved brothers and sisters in Wales, the church that brought the gospel to our people, I remind you, Jesus is saying, I am now in charge. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Satan may have the dunamis, but Jesus Christ has the exousia. Amen? Amen. So, we are sent out with this authority. No matter what happens to us, what happens to the church disruption. In the past, PCW, you had how many churches? 1,428 churches. I checked it up. And you had 921 ministers. And you had 189,164 communicant members. Today, that's not the case. The church has dwindled. Beloved friends in Wales and around the world, when Satan is using all the dunamis to the political system, to the educational system, to the socio-economic system, to the recreational system, and whatever other system available at its disposal for us to compromise our Christian principles and belief and to draw our youths away from the church on Sunday. Please be assured, Satan does not have the final word. So it was this promise we go out with confidence into the future because Jesus has the final word. So this is what Jesus has said. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now who is a disciple? The word disciple is found only in the New Testament. And in the New Testament it's only found in the Gospel and Acts. To be a disciple is not really being like a student in the modern sense. A disciple of Jesus is someone who actively imitates both the life and obey rigidly the teachings of Jesus. What does it mean to be a disciple? Example, remember 9-11? 9-11, September 9th, 2001. What happened then? 19 young men fully committed to their faith and they believe in their God. They went to America and they shut down America. These men were disciples of their God. They were fully committed to represent their God. How much more, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, the savior of the world, can impact the world with the glory of God going into this world with this divine authority. So my dear friends, we might think because of all we are, that we are experiencing today, we have lost. The church is shrinking. No, no, no. Jesus is over all things. Or should we say all authority has been given to him and he gives it to us, his church, that we can fulfill the plan that God had from before the foundation of the world, which is explained to us, it's the blueprint drawn by God before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 and following. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, 
but with the precious blood of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. This is the mysterium tremendum that we should understand, beloved, we should understand. This is the secret weapon that we have, the blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace through his blood in the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Daniel Rowland said these words, Preach the gospel to the people, and apply the balm of Gilead, the blood of Christ, to their spiritual wounds, and show the necessity of faith in the crucified Savior. So, if we want to win Wales back to Christ, if we want to win Wales back to Christ, we must never be ashamed to end all our sermons with the blood, reminding our listeners of the blood of Christ on the cross. Preach the blood and behold what God will. It's not in, it's not in my, 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 my notes. But I, I'll share it with you. I didn't want to share it because I, I don't want to appear holy or anything. No, I'll share this il illustration to you. I was having a crusade in Clandlin now, right in North Wales. And uh, the chairman was a close friend of Mag Margaret Thatcher. She was a, was a, was a main uh, guest of honor that night. I was very nervous because I, I got on the plane in New Delhi at two o'clock in the morning. I have to fly all the way to London. Then from London, you have to drive, drive about six, seven hours to get to London now. So I wanted to sleep. The minute I got into the plane in New Delhi, I sat be, beside three big English gentlemen. So the minute the plane took off, the seatbelt sign went off. I pulled my eyes in and I began to sleep. But these three big English gentlemen they began to order whiskey and beer. And they began to drink. And they began to drink, they made a little noise. I got angry, but I couldn't show my anger. I wasn't going to preach, you see. I sat down like that. They continued, continued shout, shouting, shouting, shouting. Oh, I got so mad. Then eventually I heard my, my table pulled down and they put the empty bottle of whiskey and beer on my table. And I became very angry, but I couldn't show. Then the captain announced uh, breakfast. And I took off my eye sheet, and there all these empty bottles were in front of me. Everybody in the plane were looking at me. And I called the steward. <laughs> I called the steward, and he was very apologetic. He cleared the table, and I bent down, took out my Bible, opened it, and I began to read. And the gentleman sitting next to me, he shoved me like this. Rip Van Winkle, you got up. I said, yes. You're reading. I said, he did this. Yes. You're reading the Bible? I said, yes. What are you reading? And I told him, sir, I'm reading about the blood of Christ shed on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And to my surprise, he put his arms around me and he began to cry. He said, I've let God down. I've let my wife down. He said, sir, would you like to invite Christ into your life? He said, yes, I would love to. Would you like to pray? I prayed with him the sinner's prayer, 40,000 in the air. Then he told me that he and his two other friends have been laying oil pipelines in the desert of Punjab to join with Iran, and they're going home after 18 months. Then he asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. I'm going to preach in Wales. Wales? Who? Not, his friend right, sitting right there must have come from him. Hey, buddy, this man is a preacher. He's going to preach in with Wills, guide me, oh, thou great. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the four of us began to sing that hymn in the plane. We became friends. What did I preach? I did not. The blood. The blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. The secret of the revival. 
I close with the words of Evan Roberts. This is what he said. What we need is a fresh vision of the cross. And may that mighty, all-embracing love of his be no longer a fit, fit, fitful, wavering influence in our lives, but the ruling passion of our souls. I've tried to share with you from my heart, none, moderator. I cry for you in Wales. My church has only 6,000 members. We are a big church now because you planted the seed in our area. Don't lose hope. Christ has the authority. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time to recommit our lives to you, Lord, and the authority. We go into Wales to win Wales back to Jesus Christ. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, on behalf of us all, Robert, thank you so much for coming, for speaking, and for touching our hearts. And the mean on thy he we wish you well now as you go on on your onward journey. And may God bless you and keep you. We close by singing the hymn, the the Welsh hymn. We couldn't find an English translation. We have. We have now, do we? Oh, there we are, we have, because there is a Miso translation as well. So, yes, oh. The Mexican wave there from uh, from Yara back and an Aaron, yes, going for it. So yes, indeed. So um, you can sing it in Welsh, English, or in Miso.
Mae'n eich gwybod chi i cydiad yn llaw a chymydog. A i ddweud y gras a gyda'n gilydd. If we can invite you to share each other's hands for us to say the grace together. Show that we are one part of one family. Gras sain harlwy is i grist. A chari ar diw. A chymdeithas ar y sbryd gra. A fydd o gyda niwr. O'r awr hon, hyd fyth. Amen. Amen.